Chanel is undoubtedly the most famous fashion designer in history and one of the most influential. But much of what we think we know about Chanel is false. Throughout her life, she lied constantly. And uh, at one point, one of her biographers said, how old was she when she was 20? <laughs> uh, however, her importance really doesn't lie in the things for which she's most famous, you know, the idea that she invented the little black dress or costume jewelry or designer perfume. None of those things are true. She didn't invent them. She didn't destroy the corset. Uh, she wasn't the first woman to cut her hair short. But in fact, her significance is much more subtle and has much more to do with creating an image of herself as the modern woman. So today I'm going to look at her in the context of gender and of fashion designers, whether men or women. Now the fashion photographer Cecil Beaton wrote, between Poiret's harem, Paul Poiret's orientalist fashions of the teens, between Poiret's harem and Dior's new look, two women dominated fashion. And they were Chanel and Scaparelli. But this doesn't mean that they, those were the first women fashion designers to become famous or successful. Back in the 18th century, Rose Bertin, the, a milliner, as they were known then, someone who provided decorations for dresses and hats and hair, and who created new styles because the shape of the dress remained largely the same. It was the decorations that were renewed. Rose Bertin became known as Marie Antoinette's minister of fashion. She was, became extremely wealthy and famous, unlike most dressmakers and milliners. Um, and one of the aristocrats of the time said how she was incredibly arrogant, really sort of the, the paradigm of the dominating fashion designer, that she boasted constantly about the things that she made for Marie Antoinette, whereas most milliners went to ladies' homes to, to bring them the things. She insisted that you come to her shop to where she would describe what the latest thing, expensive thing you should buy for her would be. Indeed, women dominated women's fashion from the late 17th century until well into the 19th century. Um, historically, if you look sort of in world historical terms, throughout most of world history, women have been responsible for making textiles and clothing. But when clothing production began to be professionalized and formed into guilds, the men took over. There were still women sewing, couturiers, but they weren't allowed to be in any guild. And they petitioned Louis XIV to allow them to form their own guild, which he did in 1675. And after that point, essentially, the couturiers, the female dressmakers, made most women's clothes, and tailors made men's clothes, with a few things of certain tailored clothes the tailors made for women. So they played a very, very important part in the fashion industry and helped make Paris by the 18th century the capital of fashion. In the 19th century also, women dominated the field of fashion for women. However, the names of those early female designers have almost all been forgotten. This dress is by Madame Vignon. Other women who were successful dressmakers then include Madame Palmyra, Madame Camille. Nobody's heard of these women. They were completely cast into the shade by the rise of the first great male designer of the 19th century, Charles Frederick Worth, who is seen as the father of the grande couture, which later became known as the haute couture. What Worth did was to transform dressmaking from being a small scale artisanal craft primarily practiced by working class women into big business and high art. As you can see from this Mary Cassatt print, most dressmakers were subordinate to their clients. So here you see her kneeling below, fitting, well, fitting, but hemming what the length of the dress would be. And indeed, the dressmaker worked together with her client to create the dress. So the woman would go to a, play, a store and buy fabric, and then she would hire a dressmaker who would come and they would discuss what kind of a dress she wanted to have made. They would look at 
patterns, they would look at fashion plates. So it was a collaborative process. In some places, very wealthy people would have their own dressmaker who was attached to the household as a kind of servant. So this was, although it was a, a good job for women, and there were many thousands of dressmakers in Paris, as well as in other cities in the United States, it was still very much a working class job. Most women started in their early teens as apprentices and worked their way up. If they were good enough, lucky enough, they were able to start their own small dressmaking establishment, which usually would have only a couple of assistants and apprentices. So a very small scale business. What Worth did then, and this is not Worth, this is another male designer. What Worth did was turn it into a big business. And so his, here you see with the turn of the century couturier, his assistants are female. The workforce is still largely female, but it's become really proletarianized where they're working for a designer who is primarily a businessman who might or might not be the one actually creating the new styles. Moreover, though, these styles were not done on an individual basis. I'll talk to you, my client, about what you want, unless you were someone like the Empress Eugenie. For most of them, the designer would pr present a collection, and you would choose from drawings which thing you wanted, and then it might be made up in different fabric for you. But essentially, it was one of a line of models that he or she would be presenting to you. So it becomes a vastly different business. And the rise of the Grand Couture, which occurred in the second half of the 19th century, was occurred at the same time as the rise of ready-to-wear clothing and the retail revolution of the department store. So if you were a wealthy woman, you went to a couturier, who might be a man or a woman, to have the couture clothes. Or if you were a middle-class woman, or even a working class woman for a special occasion dress, you go to a department store and then take the partially made dress and bring it either home to work on it yourself or to a small local dressmaker who would then fit it to you. So the business of fashion is becoming much more professionalized as you enter into the sort of era of high capitalism. Nevertheless, Women designers were very quick to pick up on Worth's change in st the structure of the fashion atelier. And a woman like Jean Paquin, who designed this dress, was already by the turn of the century a very famous and successful couturière. She, like Worth, had hundreds of employees instead of only a handful. In the so-called uh, March of the revolutionary march of the little dressmakers. One of the verses went something like this in translation. What does the little seamstress demand of the house of Worth or of Paquin? More money, less work. So Paquin was a very, very successful designer. She was elected president of the Haute Couture Association for the 1900 uh, World's Fair in Paris. She was the first woman fashion designer to receive the Legion of Honor. And in 1917, she was elected president of the Chambre Syndicale de la Haute Couture. So at this point, she's already a very, very successful woman. And since Chanel was born in 1883, she was still only a small child when uh, Paquin was emerging into fame. Paquin's career was a little bit cast in the shade by the rise of Paul Poiret, who was famous for his very lush orientalist and Empire style fashions, and for the very beautiful pochoir colored prints that he produced with illustrators like Paul Iri and Georges Barbier. This, however, is not a Poiret. This is a Jean Paquin, because she very quickly caught on to new styles and new modes of visual display. So you notice this is only about a decade after the previous image that you saw, so it's about 1911. She has presented here a high-waisted dress, essentially corsetless, either with a brassiere and, and short uh, elasticized girdle or some other kind of tango-like girdle that was soft. Very brilliant color, um, much more body-freeing 
and then the sort of the emphasis on line and color as opposed to the very constructed fashions that had dominated the 19th century. So again, corsetry is disappearing before Chanel has a career as a designer at all. There were many, many other designers working in the early 20th century. The green dress in the background is by Jean Allais, and the pink one is by a Madame, by Callot sisters, the, who were a group of sisters, and many couturiers did work together with sisters or mother-sister pairs. Um, group of sisters who inherited a lace shop and who created a very, very successful couture house. If you've read Marcel Proust, you may remember a scene when Marcel's mistress, Albertine, is learning about fashion. And Marcel says to her, is there really such a difference between a callow dress and any other dress? And Albertine says, of course there is, little man. Only, unfortunately, what costs 3,000 francs for the callow costs only 200 for a regular dress. But only someone who knows nothing can't tell the difference between them. A later and much more famous designer, Madeleine Viennet, who we'll see later, said that it was because of working for the Callot sisters that she learned how to make Rolls Royces and not Fords. <laughs> she said that Madame Gerbet, the oldest and most important of the Callot sisters, was a great woman totally dedicated to dressing women and dressing women's bodies in a way which was freeing. Another very, very great designer um, was Jean Lanvin. Karl Lagerfeld said Lanvin was a great, great designer. But by the time she was famous, she was a nice old lady. She wasn't this kind of jet set figure like Chanel was. And so this is one of the reasons I think that she's been relatively forgotten. She started out almost exactly the same age as Chanel, very, very poor like Chanel. Uh, essentially an orphan. She took care of and raised all of her brothers and sisters, apprenticed as a milliner, and then started her own little hat shop. She had a daughter who she dressed beautifully, and her clients started looking at the daughter's clothes and saying, wouldn't you make clothes for my daughter? So then she moved into that, and then she started her own couture house, where she'd make especially famous mother-daughter dresses. So you see here a uh, fashion plate from Gazette de Bontemps, and then you see an image of Jeanne Lanvin in the 1930s. I had thought of her primarily in terms of the pretty mother-daughter dresses, and she did a lot of very romantic robes de steel with big paniers in the 20s, sort of old-fashioned, glamorous dresses. But what I didn't really realize until I started working on an exhibition about the, the modern woman, create, fashioning the modern woman, and I started seeing a lot of Lanvin's clothes from the 1930s when she really sort of entered into, I think, her greatest period of creation. And I saw they were so immensely sophisticated and incredible. And again, she used her daughter, who by that time had grown up and married an aristocrat. She used her as her best model. But notice, she's using her daughter as her best model. One of the reasons, as we'll see, that Chanel became and remained so famous was that she was not just a, the woman, the femme créatrice, the couturière, but she was also her own best fashion model. So those two, the idea of the model and the fashion designer, overlapped. Here you see a hat designed by Chanel, who also began as a milliner. Well, she began as a kept woman, actually. Uh, Chanel was very poor and <laughs> tried to be a singer in a cafe, which is probably where she got the nickname Coco. She used to say that that was her father's nickname, but that's almost certainly a lie. Um, her father had abandoned her when she was about 12. Coco was one of the names that was frequently used for sort of public women. Um, she became the lover of a very wealthy man and was a kept woman for a number of years. When she developed with him her own kind of style, which was somewhat uh, casual, a bit androgynous, uh, in contrast to his first and more important mistress, who Emiliane d'Alencon, who was an actress and courtesan who looked very glamorous and lushly feminine. So Chanel was kind of setting herself off looking somewhat different. 
Then she had another boyfriend, Boy Capel, and as she later told Salvador Dali, I was able to open my own fashion house because two men were fighting over my hot little body. <laughs> so the two men helped pay for first her millinery shop, and then uh, initially it was a boutique in Deauville where she started to make very interesting sportswear, made often out of humble materials like jersey, but for which she charged very, very high fees. And this is an interesting phenomenon. So, uh, a number of years ago, I was in England, and I got a chance to interview Mrs. James Rothschild and about couturiers that she had known when she was young back in the 20s and 30s. And she uh, had gotten married in a Callow sister's wedding dress. When she met with me, she kindly dug out one of her Madeleine V&A blouses to wear for the lunch. And I asked, did she ever wear clothes by Chanel? And remember, this is Mrs. Rothschild in her beautiful house in the court of St. James, surrounded by art. She said, oh no, my dear, her clothes were much too expensive. My husband would never have allowed that. <laughs> but Chanel was very savvy in realizing that by charging a lot, and particularly for things that often were made of simple materials or that looked simple, that had its own kind of cachet. Over there you see a picture, a, a caricature by Sem called True Chic, which is sometimes described as having been a dress by Chanel. Here, however, we do see a dress by Chanel from the 1920s. And you can see that it's very simple, very um, humble even looking. Paul Poiret was kind of appalled by it. He thought that her clothes were, looked poor and he called it poverty deluxe. And she said, no, it's not poverty, it's simplicity. And she said, a little black dress is more difficult to make than Scheherazade, you know, these Orientalist fantasies that Poiret was making. She also said that Poiret's brilliant colors made her literally nauseous. And she liked colors like black and navy blue and white. There's also in her style uh, something very boyish. And the sort of look of La Garçon, the boyish girl, uh, was very much part of her style. Uh, and it was also very much part of a kind of lesbian style which had emerged already two decades before. Um, Chanel also told Dali, and remember we're dealing here with witnesses, one liar talking to another liar, <laughs> writing about it years later. But uh, according to what Dali writes, she said to him that she had always wanted to be like a strong, independent male, and she dressed like that herself. Certainly she identified with powerful, rich men and wanted to acquire for herself the kind of independence that they had. Now, on the other side, however, we see virtually identical clothes by Jean Patou, a male designer from the 20s. And indeed, I used to assign my students, I'd go look at pictures from the 1920s and find which ones are the Chanel's. And first of all, they're not that many. Second of all, they look like what almost everybody else was doing. So by this point, a style had emerged. She was one of the pioneers, but by no means the only one. Now, at this point, it's important to realize that in those interwar years, the 20s and 30s, it wasn't just Chanel and Schiaparelli who dominated fashion. It was a whole regiment of women. There were a few male designers between the wars, but they were very much overshadowed by the women. Jean Patou, for example, said in an interview, very defensively said, it is possible for a man to design women's clothes because most people started to think it wasn't possible that for the new modern woman who was emerging in the 20s, who better to dress her than another modern woman? This really became the kind of cliche of the 20s. And just as women were really instrumental in creating the fashion of the 20s, so also was this fashion instrumental in creating the look of the modern woman. By the 30s, however, fashion had begun to move towards a much more feminine and retro mode. And so did Chanel. Here we have one of her dresses that she designed in the late 1930s. And a lot of designers were moving in this direction towards something that was almost Belle Epoque, 
hemlines went down, waists went in. You're getting a much more glamorous kind of look, really kind of the precursor of the new look that Dior would launch in 47. But it's a look that was put on ice in 1939 once the Nazis occupied Paris and fashion became much more practical, shorter, more uh, functional. Here we see Chanel herself in the 30s with Serge Lafarge um, of the Paris Opera Ballet. And she's wearing trousers, which a number of women did uh, for casual, sporty events at the beach or for sports. Uh, and, but to the best of my knowledge, she wasn't actually making trousers for any of her clients. I haven't seen any yet that she clearly made, although she made them for herself. So Chanel was a really interesting and important designer in the 20s and 30s. She had the shortest skirts in Paris in the 20s, but when fashion changed, her hemlines dropped like everyone else. She was very, very successful. Um, but she was also quite jealous of her female competitors, and they were mostly female, the great designers in Paris at this time. So for example, Madeleine Viennet, she was nervous about Viennet because Viennet was widely regarded as being the greatest artistic exponent of the couture in the 30s. <coughs> now this is a wonderful fashion plate by Thayat, <laughs> uh, a gay Italian illustrator who worked extensively with Viennet for years and uh, with this very sort of stylized illustration. Here we see Madeleine Viennet herself. And Viennet had a very, very interesting and unusual way of creating dresses. As you'll recall, she had worked earlier with um, the Kello sisters. Then she'd gone over to England to design. She'd been married, divorced, had a child. The child died. She started her own couture house in a difficult time in 1913, had to close with the First World War. She opens again in 1919 and stays open until 1939, so about 20 years there, in which she became famous for creating really body-worshipping clothes. She's famous, although it's not accurate to say, she's famous as the inventor of the bias cut. That's not true. People have known about the bias cut for a long time, but she did maximize its use creating clothes that were very fluid, that moved over the body in a very graceful way. She said, uh, I've, never worn, I've never been able to stand a corset myself. Why should I put other women in dresses that need corsets? On the other hand, she insisted that her clients have beautiful bodies. And if somebody who she thought didn't have a beautiful body came to her couture house, she would just say, oh, va-t'en, get out. I'm not dressing you. <laughs> so she did this first stage where she'd make the little tiny miniature model in three dimensions. So, and then she would make a larger one and she would call in one of the women that she, whose bodies and whose movement she admired. And she particularly liked uh, some of her South American clients because she said, you know, they had magnificent bodies and they could move. Which, what did she say? They had like the, the loins of pantheresses. I mean, she really, she used very sexualized language how beautiful they were and they could move. And she'd put the clothes on them and then see exactly what worked or didn't work. But what she wanted was to create clothes that moved with the body. And she never sought to, the body was the preeminent thing, the body and the woman herself. So it was not a question of a dress as a magnificent piece, but of something that would really work as a moving garment. And she was very dismissive of Chanel. She said, Chanel is you know, a very chic woman. But what she admired were people like Madame Gerbet at the Callot Sisters, who were really craftspeople, who knew how to make a piece of fabric do exactly what they wanted it to do. And for these reasons, she was regarded by connoisseurs as being the greatest dressmaker of that period. So people, later couturiers also, like Balenciaga, really worshipped her because of these skills. She was obsessed with uh, being copied because she was copied relentlessly. And she tried and tried with, she photographed all of the, her clothes from different angles, would file those with the court in Paris so there would be a record that she designed it first and it wouldn't be copied. Then when her labels were also copied, she had developed a label with her th own thumbprint on it to try and prevent that from being copied. 
Copyists were legion, and it didn't work, of course. There was no international copyright law for fashion, and there still isn't. Um, I once acquired, uh, actually I acquired one, and I've seen other fakes of V&A, which you can see why she was so upset, because they're tragically bad. You can see exactly what they're trying to do, but they didn't have the incredible skill to do it themselves. This is one of my favorite pictures of her clothes. You can just see the totally lush, body-worshipping look of these clothes. Scaparelli. Now, Scaparelli was another really important and really famous designer in the 19, late 1920s and 30s. Chanel was incredibly jealous of Scaparelli because Scaparelli, especially in the second half of the 30s, cast Chanel in the shade. Uh, Ch Chanel referred to her as that Italian artist who makes clothes. That was not a compliment, calling her an artist, because Chanel said that fashion was not art. Fashion was part of life, and it was a business. Um, and Scaparelli retaliated by calling Chanel a dreary little bourgeoise. So there was no love lost between them. In one account, at a party, Chanel invited Scaparelli to dance, and then tried to maneuver her over somewhere where her headpiece would get caught in candles. <laughs> Scaparelli had a very different attitude towards fashion. She really did think that it was art, and she liked working with artists. So she worked, for example, with Salvador Dali to create this ensemble with the famous shoe hat and the jacket with the lips pocket. So picking up on surrealist ideas about body parts and metamorphosis and sort of and sexual symbolism. Chanel, uh, Scaparelli, unlike Viennet or Lanvin or Chanel, who all came from very, very poor families. Viennet went out to work when she was 13. Um, Scaparelli came from an upper middle class Italian family, but she made a very big mistake when she married this bizarre theosophist. <laughs> and when they went off to America, he abandoned her and she was stuck raising their child alone. So she took her back to Paris, and then, since she spoke several languages, she would take wealthy American ladies around to couture houses at, so they could go shopping. And at Paul Poiret's, she couldn't resist trying on a cape. And Poiret said, Madam, it looks fabulous on you. You should buy it. And she said, well, I can't afford it. And he said, well, I'll give it to you. And they bonded, particularly because they both had this idea that the designer was an artist, and they both really loved color and fantasy. So despite being discouraged by other designers who said, you don't know enough, she went on and became a couturier. Here we see her in the period of the 30s, at her most famous. And here you can see, for example, the dress close to me is a Scaparelli, and the one away from me is a Chanel. So both of them are sort of 30s, dark, uh, in one case a dress and the other a suit. But Scaparelli's suits are really structured, and what she wants is a lot of interesting ornamentation on the surface. So for example, the amazing uh, trompe l'oeil embroidery. Whereas Chanel has this wealth of jewelry, sort of mixture of real and costume jewelry over you know, sort of a, a, a officially simple looking black dress. There were, however, many other designers then who were also creating extraordinary pieces. This one here, for example, is by, now sorry, this one is still by Scaparelli. This is her tear dress, which is another trompe l'oeil uh, dress that she designed with Salvador Dali. Again, playing with the idea of being dressed, undressed, rags versus couture. The fabric has a trompe l'oeil pattern of tears or rips in it, so as though the clothing has been, is falling apart on you. Years before Vivian Westwood or uh, Rei Kawakubo created actual ripped clothes, we have the idea of ripped clothes here. Now this is uh, a dress photographed by Man Ray by Louise Boulanger, of whom it was said that the woman who wanted to dress in a way that was three seasons ahead of the style could go to Louise Boulanger. Now, she also put her name together, because Boulanger is a very common name. It'd be like Louise Smith. So she put it all together, and you could find her all in one word. Then Augusta Bernard did the same thing, because Bernard's like Jones. 
And then Maine Bosher, an American uh, who was working at, at French Vogue, decided that he'd become a couturier also, and he put his names together and became Maine Bosher. So it was kind of a little trend at that point to create a name. But Louise Boulanger, although she only made a few clothes, made really extraordinarily beautiful clothes. Another one who I adore is Jane Regny. We've bought several of her dresses for the museum. She was an upper middle class tennis player, professional tennis player, who then decided to go into creating sport couture. So she had her own couture house with all lots of uh, the kind of sweaters and pleated skirts and things like that that you would wear for active sportswear. And then there was Paul Poiret's younger sister, Nicole Grult, who was, didn't want to go into work for her brother, so she started her own fashion company doing very chic, modern clothes. Um, Poiret, meanwhile, was in a circle of decline because he refused to leave his very elaborate orientalist fashions. So at one point, his car was in a traffic jam and her car was nearby, and Poiret turned to his friend and said, the woman in that car used to be my sister. Here we have some beautiful day clothes by Augusta Bernard, who created very, very few clothes. Uh, but those that, that she did create were always featured at the Concourse d'Elegance, in vogue, chosen as the most beautiful dress of the year, etc. Here we have a dress by Alix, uh, later more famously known as Madame Grey. Uh, Alix was. Uh, another upper middle class woman. And this is an interesting thing because suddenly you're finding in the period between the wars, more middle class and upper middle class women are going out to work, but they're still being tra or tracking themselves somewhat towards feminine professions like fashion. So that, for example, Madame Grey had wanted to be a sculptor. And her parents said, no way. We know what artists are like. You're not doing that. So she said, well, can I study couture? So she was an apprentice. She took lessons and then became a couturier. And she didn't necessarily care so much about how the clothes fit, as you'll see with a later, a later dress. But here we have, uh, this is by Marcel Chaumont, who was one of V&A's uh, associates. This is later from the 1940s, after V&A had closed her couture house. And it's interesting about V&A because v &A identified so much with women and with women workers. She gave all of her workers chairs with backs instead of stools, a cafe with free lunches, maternity care, paid vacations. I mean, it was absolutely extraordinary for that period in France. One of Chanel's former workers went from the Chanel Atelier to the v &A, and when she went in, her jaw just dropped, and she said, it's like the Ritz in here. She couldn't believe that the working conditions were so good. Even after she closed her couture house, v &A spent the rest of her life working to support women, particularly young women, who were working in the fashion industries so that they were protected. She recalled how when she was a teenager, she'd be paid half as much as an adult for this, doing the same amount of work. And she was really agitating for the rights of women workers in the fashion industries. Here we have a dress by Mad Carpentier, which is actually a, two women. Um, Mad Maltezos and Susie Carpentier, who created a couture house together. And here we have another Alix, or Madame Grey. Um, she said at one point that when she was beginning to learn how to dress, she said, sometimes the dress would look magnifique, but she wouldn't know if the poor lady was going to be able to move in it. <laughs> and it was really, for her, although with her most exquisite <laughs> classical gowns, they have that very fluid look. But whereas v &As were, were really fluid, hers often are much more constructed inside. For her, it was much more about the appearance of the dress. For v &A, it was about the body moving freely in the dress. Meanwhile, to wind this up fairly quickly, in the States also, this period and the subsequent decade had a lot of great women designers. Elizabeth Hawes, graduate of Vassar, who went to Paris and was loved all of the, you know, the v &As and the clothes she saw there, and came back and started her own small couture house. Valentina, very dramatic 
Russian designer who came to New York and made theater costume and also uh, ladies couture, but she was a complete dictator. So women would come in and they'd go, my husband likes yellow, or I like yellow, and she'd go, yellow is for flowers. Next, you know, we're giving you a navy dress. Or she would say, like, mink is for football. You know, she just would tell you what to wear, and you either accepted it or didn't accept it. Her husband was having an affair, I guess, with Greta Garbo, so that was very complicated. And she, this is her. She insisted on posing in her clothes for all of the fashion magazines. The clothes are very, very beautiful, even though she seems to have been a piece of work. <laughs> um, now Claire McArdle, the, probably the most famous woman sportswear designer in America, who in the 30s uh, said, went to Paris and would buy v &A clothes and then take them home and dissect them and figure out how were they made and then figure out, is it possible to make dresses like this for ready to wear? So it's all very well if you're a brilliant couturier and you're making it a one of a kind dress. But what if you're sort of producing them to sell to a department store, lots of them? And I went and looked at McArdle's um, notebooks at Parsons Library. And she, she would have the price of how many, like five buttons equals 25 cents. I mean, she was really trying to figure out how you could manufacture clothes that were still good clothes and still free clothes, but um, freeing to your body, but would be affordable. During the years that Paris was occupied by the Nazis, American designers like Claire McArdle got a huge boost of publicity and sales. But in the beginning, the department stores would just tout them as American designers. And a lot of the designers then were complaining, saying, who are they, robots? Can we have their name on the clothes? And she fought very much to have her name on the clothes which was something which was the norm in Paris, but not in America, where it was the store or the manufacturer, not the designer who was credited. Here you have another um, one of Claire McArdle's dresses. I think you can see how much she learned from someone like V&A. So you have all these decades now when women have been creating successful careers as fashion designers. And then after World War II, the only two well, the only one who's left standing out of all of these is Madame Grey. Chanel closes her house, although as we'll see, she reopens in 54. And the new generation of designers that emerged in Paris are almost all men. Christian Dior, Christabel Balenciaga, Jacques Faf. And uh, there were a number of articles about why was this? And at one point, Jacques Faf, shown here with his model, was interviewed and they said, well, why do you think it's all these men now? And he said, fashion is an art and men are the artists. The only role a woman should have in fashion is wearing the clothes. Now, it's very interesting, this idea that fashion is an art was one that was held by many designers in France. But as the reporter said, and as many of the women designers who were interviewed said, what about Vianne? Well, she was an artist, she was a woman, how come Suddenly, there's been this shift. I think that there are many socio and economic reasons why we find this shift, but part of the reason is it's much more expensive to open a couture house after World War II. Dior was backed by the Boussac cotton fortune. When Madeleine Vianney opened her couture house, all you needed were two or three good clients to front you a little money. So it becomes a much more of a big, big business. And then also, the late 40s, the 50s, were very much a period of the feminine mystique, when the idea that men did men's things and women did women's things. And somehow this art idea had the male designers in France, and gradually the name designers in the US too, like Norel, would start saying, we're the ones who can be objective about women. I think also it probably um, had something to do with a, a very romanticized but desexualized way that you were supposed to be relating to the designer. <coughs> there were a number of articles in the American press in the 50s with titles like that friend of your wife's named Dior, which really imply that you are sending your wife to this great genius designer, but don't worry, he's gay. So she can be friends with him, he'll know exactly how to make her look beautiful for you, but you don't need to worry about it. So interesting kind of subtext. Chanel came back, reopened her house. She closed it in 39. She reopened it in 54, 
partly because she was furious with Dior and Balenciaga and all these guys who were so successful. She'd been jealous of people like Scaparelli before, but now uh, she made all these very hateful homophobic remarks, you know, saying that people like Dior and Balenciaga um, wanted to be women and so they created women's dresses that made them look like drag queens and she starts to position herself as the friend of women, sort of like the woman designer who will save you from these fashion guys. So it was another story, a completely new story that she started to promote, but because her clothes were much more uniform, for, especially for a lot of American clients, they were kind of a relief from the very elaborate, fanciful, feminine clothes which were coming out particularly from Dior and Fath, not so much from Balenciaga. In the 60s, you start to get suddenly a new wave of younger women who start to create relatively inexpensive clothes for a much younger demographic. Mary Quant, of course, is the most famous with all of her little mini dresses, but we see the same thing in France uh, with people like Sonia Riquiel, Emmanuel Kahn, who are creating not great works of art, nobody ever called them that, but simple, fun little dresses that young women could wear and afford. Then, in some places like England, fashion was not considered particularly a great art. And there was tremendous sort of subcultural energy with groups like first the mods and then the punks. And so you get someone like Vivian Westwood who can emerge creating sort of punk and post-punk fashion and getting a real reputation for doing this sort of very out there clothing. Eventually when she became bigger, she started showing the clothes in Paris, but in a way it was because clothes were not a big deal industry in England, but they were something that obsessed young people. There was an opening for more women designers in England than there was for, a lot for women in France. Meanwhile, in the United States, the whole ready-to-wear industry spawned women as well as men, and probably one of the most successful of the women designers was Donna Karen, who had dropped out of Parsons to work for another women sportswear designer, Anne Klein, and who then sort of became famous creating clothes for urban working women like herself with ad campaigns that showed, you know, the first woman president and women as exe successful executives and clothes that were not supposed to be imitations of men's business suits but nevertheless would look professional. And as she said also that clothes that you could wear and you could eat in them and they weren't going to be suddenly too tight to fit. <laughs> One of the greatest of all of the women who emerged in the 20th, later 20th century was Ray Kawakubo, uh, whose company, Comme des Garçons, revolutionized world fashion in the 1980s, and who I'm sure you know is going to be honored with an enormous retrospective at the Metropolitan Museum in opening in May. Really one of the most creative and radical designers in the entire world, uh, admired by other designers probably more than anyone else. Mucha Prada, uh, who turned a little uh, sort of handbag and glove company that she inherited from her family into the most important um, fashion company in Italy. And then last, Phoebe Philo, uh, the designer behind Celine, an English woman working for a house in France that's become known not just for fashionistas, but being a fashion company where the sensibility is very much thought to be that of a woman designer who's interested in not making women look like dolls, but making them look like competent, real, but also fashionable people. So in this way, just a brief, quick run through the vicissitudes of women in fashion. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take yeah, a couple questions if there are any. No questions? Yes, back there. I'm going to close this because I can't hear you. There's someone talking out here.
Yes, I did. Okay, the question was about the, the new modesty look. What might be leading up to it and will it take off? Well, there are a couple of things going on with that. I think that um, a lot of fashion is really just the pendulum effect. I certainly believe that fashion is significant socially and culturally and politically, but not every switch of fashion is profoundly important. I always remember a few years ago, um, now, gosh, a few years ago, now it must have been 20 years ago, there was uh, a headline in Women's Wear Daily commenting on how fashion had moved from the cat house to the convent, from very, very sexy clothes to very, very modest clothes. And I think that the new modesty in fashion is partly a response to there's been so much sort of body exposure both within designer fashion and in terms of popular culture. So there's a bit of a pendulum swing there. There may also, though, be a sense that um, a number of designers feel that their customers want to be taken seriously, and particularly in this political climate, that may translate into a look which is more covered up to make a sort of somewhat more forthright statement, I am not a sex object, uh, which doesn't mean that we're that the miniskirt is history or anything else, but at this moment, it may be that a lot of people are guessing that that will be something that they feel their customer will be interested in. Because right now, it's a been a very bad period for the fashion industry. Nobody's buying clothes, or rather, I take that back. They're buying clothes, but they're only buying it from H&M or Uniqlo. And so designers at this point in history are really desperate to figure out what people want to buy. And they're really looking much more, much less at my inspiration is and much more at what's been selling in stores. What are people telling me when I go around to stores telling me what they want to see? And certainly Phoebe Philo, although she's perfectly capable of doing cutouts and has one dress that has, you know, sort of spider webs around the breast, which is not so much sexual as really weird. But her, in general, her clothes are much more kind of covered up and they're comfortable and pants and big sweaters and things. So um, I think that that's a partial answer to this issue of the new modesty. I don't think that it's a huge zeitgeist switch away from sexual expression, but I do think that at this moment it may be something that designers feel their clients are, are wanting. Another question. Yes. Uh, I'm just wondering what fashion brings to us. Is it because it also obviously class privilege, like higher class? Uh, I mean, richer people are likely by expensive class, ex expensive clothes, that is more fashionable. As you said, like designer dresses rather than you know productive in the industry. So I was wondering what fashion. Brings Oh, Burberry, okay. Yeah, Burberry. Yeah, so like how their, how, what's their position in the fashion industry? Because I've seen their advertisement said that how they're devoted in the Second World War to creating the clothes that people can use in the military. Mm. And I've seen recently there are fashion brands that they're creating that sort of t-shirt right to feminism brand, like low Oh. It takes like hundreds of dollars to buy that. Thing. Right. So, <laughs> okay. The question, I mean, if, does fashion reinforce class privilege? Fashion, well, let me start with something that Elizabeth Wilson once said, which seemed very relevant. If you've seen her book, Adorned in Dreams, she said, thesis, fashion is oppressive. Antithesis, fashion is pleasurable. So men, much of the time, we do feel often that fashion is something which is for rich people or it reinforces class barriers. On the other hand, 
I always say in response to that, imagine a lawyer, a very wealthy, successful lawyer. Now imagine a hairdresser's assistant, could be male or female. Who's likely to be more fashionable? The hairdresser's assistant, because he or she cares about fashion. Whether he or she makes it themselves, buys pieces at a thrift store, saves up and gets something at a sample sale, interest in fashion more than money per se is what makes you fashionable. Um, fast fashion is not good for the planet, but it certainly provides a cheap facsimile of high fashion and, and a virtual, even for an expert, almost impossible to say. I, mean, I, could, I wish I had a dollar for every time I've said to someone, oh my god, is that by so and so? And they go, no, it's H&M. You know? <laughs> so I think that with companies want to appeal to your fantasies. And one fantasy which is still very widespread is many people want to look richer than they are, um, which could be seen as being bad or understandable. Partly if you have an idea, in America there's very, been very much an idea that clothing should be like a mirror, that it should show your true self, otherwise it's a lie. But in much of Europe, there's a different idea that clothing should be like a mask. It's your best foot forward. It's putting forward what you, what you want to be, the best you you could imagine. So if you're going to fudge a little bit about how much you know, more elegant and aristocratic you look, that is not a, necessarily a crime. Um, with a company like Burberry, I mean, Burberry designed their raincoats in World War I. And then they became very trendy as being associated with a kind of upper class style. Then the clothes started becoming very, very popular with lower class and lower middle class Britons, kind of football hooligans. And so there was a big hoo-ha among Burberry people about were they being associated with the wrong people. You know, and so they, they, they cut down drastically on producing lots of things with Burberry imp like the print all over it, because those were the ones that were being snapped up most cheaply and worn by the wrong people. What really, it was less snobbism per se than the, because they really, one person's dollar is as good as another person's dollar as far as a corporation is concerned. But they were afraid they were going to lose all of their other customers if people saw the image of the brand going down and they thought football hooligans wore it instead of upper class, you know, toffs wearing it. So all of that um, is to say that the meaning of clothing is not in the clothes itself. It's not in a Burberry scarf, say. That in and of itself doesn't mean anything. It's we who constantly create the meanings of it and recreate them at, at, at any given time. So whether Burberry seems like something stuffy or something hip or something desirable, we're the ones who are really figuring out what we want. Um, and even Dior himself at the a period in time when the designer had probably more power and influence than any other time in the late 40s to the late 50s, Dior himself said, the designer just proposes. It's the ladies who dispose. They're the ones who decide what's going to be a success or not. Most fashions that are launched are never even put into production. They're shown on the runway, the press goes, the buyers go, not my store, and it's not even produced. So it's like everybody's trying to guess what you, the customers, are going to decide is actually worth paying for. One more question? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And then later you mentioned that Chanel was really um, unhappy and jealous of the successful gay man because mm -hmm. she, she makes this homophobic comment yep. that makes women look like drag queens, which is um, a really important resource for the, for the fashion industry. So I wonder if you can talk more about the, 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 the queering part of, of, of fashion. What, what could possibly be more queer than fashion? I mean, fashion is about an ideal of beauty, which is an ideal in great tension with that of the mass society around you. I think it's not accidental that so many gay men and lesbians and bisexuals have been involved in fashion, not just for the last hundred years, but for the last 300 years. 
Um, it's not only a way to communicate who you are by your clothes to other people. Silently, and sometimes your clothes will only speak to those who you want to speak to. So when lesbians were wearing nice suits, now many heterosexual, completely bourgeois women were wearing tailored suits. That was very, it was slower to take up, come on in France because they thought it was so masculine. But in America and in Britain, it came early and strong. But for lesbians, it was like, it's going to be a little bit more masculine. We're going to have a little bit maybe like a higher man style collar. Maybe we're going to have a, a little detail, a man's signet ring, a hat just so, so that p women who were lesbians in the 20s and earlier have talked in interviews about how they could recognize other women as being lesbians by details of dress. In the same way gay men could recognize it through an ex a somewhat almost too dandified look. Um, so it's a form of communication. Chanel was probably bisexual, although she vastly preferred sleeping with men, but she did seem to have some affairs with women as well. But remember, she'd hated the women before. Uh, Chanel was full of hate. I mean, she made racist remarks. She was horribly anti-Semitic. And it's not really surprising that she would make homophobic remarks as well. She had a lot of hatred and anger in her that had built up. Um, but the, when I did the show, Queer History of Fashion, I wanted to explore this sort of great unanswered question about you know, why so many gays were, were involved in fashion. And I think that, again, as with what the rise and fall and rise again of women in fashion, there are definite social and economic components to it, as well as things which are you know, psychological or historical. So that if you're, work, if you're looking for a job, and you're a gay person, where do you think would be a friendlier environment? A fashion department or an automobile company? Just on the basis of stereotypes, you think maybe they'll be friendlier in the fashion department, like in the theater. So certain areas became more welcoming for gays to work in. So that it, um, and at certain times it can be more open and other times it's completely closeted. Dior, all his friends and colleagues knew he was gay, but it was completely a secret. He was terrified his mother would find out. And you know, so this kind of thing, you couldn't ever say anything about that. It was very different than now when you know you can get married, etc. So I think at different periods in time, that was more, more dangerous to be seen publicly as gay. And being in the fashion world provided somewhat of a safe space. Thank you very much.